Dean Safe, um, Eric, we've got Eric over here, and, and Dean, um, Dean's from Status, Eric and I with Chain Safe. Um, we're here to present to you guys uh, something that um, we worked on as a hack uh, and ended up realizing that there's a lot of actual like uh, application to it, um, and it's called Ultra Light Beam. Um, so, uh, quick outline, we're just going to kind of like go over everything and give you guys a basically a, a code walkthrough. Um, we have a full, we have a, oops, oh, sorry. We do have like a running Swift SDK uh, that works, but it, it's not. It only supports uh, Bluetooth currently, and it's a work in progress on the on Wi-Fi Direct. Um, if we want, we can show you guys how to integrate it directly into like a native Swift app right now. Um, but uh, we can do that afterwards. We're going to try and teach the principles here. So, um, you know, we have this slide that's kind of cheeky. You know, like with this Wi-Fi, uh, good luck downloading Xcode. So um, that's probably why we're not doing our walkthrough. Uh, we're doing a code walkthrough, not an actual integration. But if you have Xcode, we can do it. Um, that's like four gigs. So, uh, what, what kind of like what is Ultra Light Beam? Where did it happen? So uh, we were at Eat New York, and basically we had this crazy idea that we were going to transmit um, offline Ethereum transactions over Bluetooth and Wi-Fi Direct, um, and, and we did it. Uh, it. But you know, very naively put. Um, we started working on it from then, and then it eventually proceeded into, um, you know, we started with TypeScript, we're like, hey, let's just do a TypeScript and go. Then we're like, whoa, these by, <laughs> you know, uh, there's no support for Bluetooth in these languages, you know, um, on like Mojave. And then we're like, well, that's a problem. Um, and then we realized there's no support for um, certain functionalities of Bluetooth on, you know, only on iPhones versus Android devices. So everything we realized really quickly that like the ecosystem itself within Bluetooth, um, even Wi-Fi, wasn't sufficient. So we ended up moving more towards uh, Swift, um, and because you know, actually, as Dean will say, you can compile to pretty much anything. I still haven't seen it work, but it does. <laughs> so um, basically, what is Ultra Light Beam? We're a trans uh, transport agnostic man, uh, so a mobile ad hoc network um, uh, for sending arbitrary data over the wire. Um, basically, what that means um, is. We don't really care whether you use Bluetooth, whether you use Wi-Fi Direct, whether you're using like you know hard code like LAN. It really doesn't matter. What we're trying to do is we're trying to find a way to actually communicate over your networks that are. Uh, we don't care about really the topology. We like we only care about um, how you're transmitting data from one peer to another peer um, when you don't have a stable connection. That's like basically the idea behind this. It's like how can we actually make that work? And how can we do it um, in the future to do it so we can actually like um, do kind of like relay Ethereum transactions in or just any transaction really um, in a very unstable environment? And we'll get into that. I'll get into that shortly. Um, so quickly about Manit. Um, so Manit refers to a continuous self-configuring uh, infrastructureless network of mobile devices connected wirelessly. That's a lot of buzzwords. I have a very nice little interactive uh, thing I'm going to show you guys right now to make the difference. Um, so it kind of sounds like a mesh network, and I want to diff diff uh, you know, make the, explain the difference quite clearly. Um, so a mesh network, you can think of like a bunch of IoT devices that don't move. You know, is your camera moving? <laughs> right? Probably not. Your camera's like staying still, and Eric is going to be our camera. Um, you know? Uh, same with like your, your toaster. Your toaster probably doesn't move, or that stove that's like all connected. That, that's a mesh network. Or even your router, you know those Google like little router modules? Like they're staying in one place and typically not moving, and they're relaying this whatever the data is like in a very static way. Um, Dean over here is going to be a phone. And I'm going to be a pager. The idea here is that you know, this is technology that's sending, that is very low powered, doesn't need a lot of work, and can actually like will work on this setup. Um, so in our example, um, we are static, we're not moving, we're a mesh. But as Dean starts to move around, we're still transmitting data to him, and somehow this camera is actually moving, or no, I'm moving, sorry, as a pager, right? This camera can move too. This camera can move. <laughs> this is a mesh network, and we're transmitting data, like, Dean, hi, Dean. Hi. 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 Ping. And then, wait, Dean's going to go through this wall where there's no connectivity. We're still a man in Eric. I'm saying, hi, Dean. Hi, Dean. He's The messages are in queue. Eric, did you see my hi, Dean? Yeah, dude. You saw hi, Dean. Oh, Dean's back. Hi, Dean. Hi. Hi. So right there, you know, these messages that he didn't get, the idea is in a minute he should still get them when he comes back because Eric over here queued them up for him. Um, 
that's a man. It's a really cheeky way to do it, but you know, it proves my point, right? <laughs> Any questions on man versus mesh? How do you actually like? You know, what about the, uh, the limitations on the amount of traffic in store? Because you, you, that's spam, right? Yes, um, it is very possible. Um, we're still in early stages. Uh, we're working on a, a clever routing technique. Um, hopefully, uh, we have some like kind of uh, we've got some um, issues on GitHub uh, to ways that we can um, filter and route traffic uh, to hop have the least amount of hops. Uh, and we do that using like more centralized three layers. So somebody that would connect. But we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll get to the protocol. Um, any man at first mesh questions? Though? Just want to make sure we have the difference. Yes. What's it stand for? Uh, the <clears throat> mobile ad hoc networks. Mobile ad hoc networks. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of those words. That's why I tried to explain it that way. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's move on. Um, yeah, like, why is this super useful? Let's think about this for a second. Um, so this is kind of this photo of during it's Catalonia, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where like internet <laughs> totally cut off. We're talking like zero internet. How do you communicate with one another? Um, you can do it in, in a matter of using the tools that you already have, like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, which means like those that's not censorable. These are like non-censorable um, tools at our disposal. You know, going over data and connecting to a carrier, that's censorable, right? Because they can completely shut that off. Um, in a large crowd. All you need are a few people with uh, devices going, and you have a full-blown network, uh, and, and where you can communicate with somebody potentially on the other side of the world as long as one person has internet. Then we can be funneling all our requests through that one person until it can bounce back outwards, um, and you you know you could be like two kilometers away as long as there's people moving carrying these messages around, kind of like carrier pigeons, you know, like. They just like fly and fly and fly and eventually get to their location where they need to be. It's kind of a similar idea. Um, I don't know what this guy is. <laughs> oh, yeah, in buildings. Another really good use case for this. So, no, 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 yeah, oh, no. Like, you ever been in a building and you're, it's, there's so much concrete you just can't actually communicate with anybody? Like, your phone's down? Like, same concept. You could just keep relaying it until there's one person with internet and you can get out. And one of the things I want to like cl clearly differentiate here is like, Yes, this is to like do an offline setup, but it's also a way to actually get offline devices to actually connect to the internet uh, and send and receive messages. So that's where the like power behind this like really um, becomes like empowering for people is because you can now like we can give internet access, um, well messaging access to the internet uh, to devices that could be you know 50 stories deep with no actual active connection as long as there's somebody moving. Um, similarly, you know like in places that don't have um, access to like good infrastructure whatsoever. Um, you know, we can. This could set up like could, like in like small communities of like uh, to talk to people, right? Um, yeah. So that's uh, kind of like my intro to kind of mesh man it uh, and, and the useful applications to um, them. Do we have any questions on that? Because then we're going to talk about like the like the actual like stack here and kind of like go a little bit deeper. So this is like the best time to ask about like that stuff. <clears throat> no, but uh, yes. So is secure scuttlebutt uh, managed, or is that a protocol you would run on? Uh, you could not. You could, yeah. You you probably could run it. Um, again, this just def a man. It's like we're using a man um, simply to help. Yeah, no, yeah, you probably you could run Scuttlebutt on a mana. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, Eric's going to dive you guys deep into kind of like what all this means uh, and what we've got. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this is kind of our architectural diagram for uh, Ultralight Beam. Um, we have, I'll, I'll go into like each part separately, but. Kind of the flow is like if you're sending and receiving information, like data comes in through the transport, it goes to the node, and if the node supports like certain services, oh, am I blocking this? And if a node supports like certain services, then you know it, you know it, uh, it'll process that information. If it doesn't, it like propagates it back out to somebody else who can potentially, um, and then you know in reverse. Um, so transports, um, it's we. 
I'm not sure if we're going to stick with this name, but transports uh, in ultralight beam are, it's the communication uh, protocol, I guess. So that includes things like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi Direct, and radio. Um, but it could be like literally anything, as long as you conform to like an interface that we provide. And that interface is very simple. This is what our interface looks like. You implement a, why is it only showing half of it? Because you're using the space. Oh, sorry. Um, that's our interface. You basically have to implement two functions. It's the send and listen function. So, I mean, theoretically, like, as you can do that for like any um, form of communication. So, um, you can even do it over <clears throat> ultra high frequency, low frequency radios if you uh, if you want to implement that. Um, so transports, um, they're interesting because. Um, in ultralight beam, we can support multiple transports at the same time. So like, if you have a device that's Wi-Fi only, you have another device that's Bluetooth only, you have another device that's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, the, the, uh, the devices that are like only supporting one transport can also talk to each other by going through the second one, and that makes it super powerful. So you can create like these massive networks that are, you know, in the macro scale are very short range, but then it connects to like larger uh, other magnets to form like a huge magnet over like radio or something like that. Um, currently for ultralight beam, we support Bluetooth low energy for short distance communication, which we will demo uh, in a little bit, but um, soon we're gonna focus on Wi-Fi direct and get that working for Android. And so like we can do like a bunch of cool stuff. Um, yeah, diagram again. Um, now I'm going to talk about services. Um, so, currently, like, ultralight beam, like, the goal with ultralight beam is to be able to, like, relay these generic messages, like, these UV message payloads. But, so services are things like, um, we, we want to make it so that ultralight beam can serve, like, specific application type things as well. So we want to be able to, like, as Greg said before, like relay transactions um, <clears throat> offline, like on a plane or something like that, and then maybe one guy has Wi-Fi because they rich and they buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and they can relay those transactions on chain. Or you can even start like an offline state channel while you're on a plane. I'm not sure why you want to do that. I like using the because that's like because you never get Wi-Fi. But um, you can start like offline state channels within like a plane and send people money on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> or you can just do like a chat messaging. Um, so these are what like services are. They define like how these, like how to handle these messages um, if you're a node. And nodes don't have to support all services. They can support some services. And if they can't support it, they just like send somebody else who's on their peer list and maybe they can support it and it just keeps going and going. Um, yeah. So a relayer, we have the concept of a relayer, that's a node that generally lives like on the edge of the mesh network. Um, like for example, like in the like in a uh, like a festival or something like that, there is technically like, you know, uh, there is like cell signal, but it's like super bad. But it might be good for the guy who's like maybe a little bit further out from like the crowd. And that guy's internet. Um, so like, you know, you might try to send like a Facebook message to your mom showing that, like you're partying. <laughs> um, but you can't because you're like in the middle of the festival. So you send it out through ultralight beam. It goes like to, through a bunch of people, and then it finally hits a guy who has internet. He relays it to the internet, gets a message back, and does you know like tracing back to you. Um, so yeah. Uh, Generally, these things like live on the edge of the network. Uh, I already said that. Yeah, so we have Bluetooth low energy right now. Um, we got it working on Mac OS. Um, it should be fairly simple to get it on iOS because we're using only uh, libraries that are core Apple um, and they're cross-platform. Um, we're gonna do Wi-Fi direct soon. Um, it's gonna be supported on Android and all that. So that's gonna be dope. Uh, don't go to that. Don't go to that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we were going to prepare a full workshop, and then we got here on the first day and we realized that the internet is shit, and so getting you guys to download packages and stuff like that isn't going to work for us. Uh, so what we've decided to do is that we'll, do, we'll try to do a quick demo live of how 
one of the relay works just to show that this isn't completely vaporware, that we can actually send and receive messages. Did you guys download? Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I figured you wouldn't. Can you, can you if you guys actually have Xcode, you guys can pull our repo and join our network too. Um, but yeah, if anyone has a Mac with Xcode and internet, they could pretty much pull and join and see it in action as well. No, I don't know how. I don't have a plus phone. <laughs> Five times. A, little bit, a little bit more deep. Five more button presses. There you oh, go. Shit. Uh, That's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do we have any questions thus far? Yes. Yeah, so I was wondering about the Facebook example. So these are async messages, but can you actually initiate this in encrypted HTTP channel and do communication? Um, in theory, yeah. But um, that's like a lot of work. <laughs> We've only been working on this, like me and Dean have been like coding this for like the last four months. We've been spending like 10% of our time, 20% because we have like day jobs. Gotta put food on the table. <laughs> um, yeah, you could, we made, like design is that, or, like our, our rationale behind like our design is like we made it generic enough such that you can do whatever you want on it. This is like, we just provide you, um, you know, like a way to like just send messages, but you can definitely encrypt uh, messages. You can probably build TCP on this. You can probably build like uh, you can do HTTPS on this too, probably. Um, Is your relayer up today? Yeah, just pull this one. You pull you be your relayer. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So it's like super generic. Should work. Built it already? Uh, yeah, I built it. Okay. No error. Oh shit. Wrong match. So going back to your music festival example, the, so the guy on the periphery who actually has service, does he need to be like running this? Uh, yeah. So like everyone involved in that chain of yeah, know, yeah. So, would so, need to have this. Yeah. So like the the idea behind what we've done is we're trying to make it as minimal as possible because that way um, he, any any app could integrate this the the protocol itself. Um, as like a secondary op, as like a as like a layer on top of like an existing messaging service, right? Mm -hmm. So this isn't like uh, we're making another chat app. This is like, hey, please use this as a form to do your if to. This is like a way to like toggle like, hey, I want to like use the offline mode mm -hmm. um, to your existing like chat app. That's kind of like the design idea. So in theory, if you went into that mode, you could essentially receive messages from other apps that support UV, right? So you could have your own, the same interface. Like what, in theory, if, you know, Facebook would ever adopt it, you know, in theory, like WhatsApp could communicate with like Messenger on an offline mode, right? Yes? What about uh, privacy? So can, are there ways to prevent, or can the relayer read the messages or... No. So you can do whatever you want to the payload, right? So the message itself, we don't define how, do we? We don't. We don't define no. what you do to the message, but you can encrypt it however you would choose to, to ensure that, like, we, we want to be as less intrusive, as, as least intrusive as possible, so you can do whatever you want. You could encrypt it should you choose to. Uh, yes, just your first there. How do you um, know where to send a message? Do you like broadcast it all? Is that not incredibly noisy? So naively, we have this thing called root gossip right now, which is doing that. Um, we're working on, uh, Dean's been doing a lot of research with Oscar, shout out to Oscar, uh, um, on better routing paths so that we can do uh, more efficient hops and I actually like have less hops throughout the network itself. Uh, the problem though uh, is that, um, Typically, what you would see, in a festival, it's a little bit different. Festival, there's not people are typically standing still, so we can actually benefit from the fact that you know I can assume that a device would probably last more than a minute in roughly you know like a five meter radius. Um, but in a busier crowd, things get a little complicated because what ends up happening is you have people um, moving from uh, like you can assume like we only have connectivity for like maybe ten seconds before now the peer list might be changing. 
and drastically changing. So what we have to find is a way to do an efficient, like one, like a DHT wouldn't work here because like it would be so aggressively updating all the time. That doesn't work. So you have to maintain like a really close peer list and find like better routing paths. Um, so that's yeah. what we're working on. But if you, even if you had a static peer list, right? Like there's only one guy, let's say there's only one guy who's, who's actually got access to the, to the internet. Yeah. How do, I, how do I know the route to get to him? Like, I would broadcast to my page. In MANnets, you don't know routes. Yeah, so I That's the problem. So mesh nets have the efficiency that you can pre-calculate routes. Right. And in MANnets, because we assume a very short liveness of uh, things, or a very short liveness of the peers, we can uh, pre-determine routes. So there's certain ways to, for every hop, pick the next best by querying their peers right before the hop. But like, if there is like 15 people between you and the internet, you can do that. Right, so I have broadcast like potentially to 15 multiple like times high peer lists, they would, they would do to all that, they would do Yeah, that. Um, that's, that's how it works in the worst case. In the best case, what we have right now is that um, you try to first send to the peers who have a specific service that you need and then hop further on. Like the worst case is a uh, is, um, thing. Yeah. Did you get it? Yeah. Yeah. So, what about um, cache validation of messages? Like, is there a, a pattern to know if they go stale? Like, let's say I, I relay somebody else's message uh, out, how do I know that I got received, especially if I go out of scope? Yeah. So, um, we, we've toyed with the idea of. Um, kind of like an act where you know once we've seen it we acknowledge we like do a quick cache of it and say like we're not gonna like push this uh, if we receive it one more time we're gonna like ignore and filter um, problem being is some what that does is if the if the if your local if the if your mana disconnects from like a larger group you end up pushing that really quickly and then the message gets dropped so um, we've played with the idea of kind of like expiry times and stuff like that, but it's still kind of a big open question until we can actually deploy this um, in a bit of a large in a larger scale to actually like kind of see like how long does the message survive, you know, until it can actually get to its end user. One of the problems we've had right now as well is testing anything Bluetooth is <laughs> shit. Um, it would be optimal if we could like use something like white block and spin up all our nodes and uh, run it, but that's close to impossible because of how Bluetooth works. Bluetooth, um, the way it works is like it's driver dependent, it's operating system dependent, and then those operating systems implement different APIs. And so like our Mac implementation would be really nice if we could just spin up fake Macs and test it, but we can't do that because also you can't spin up Mac VMs because it doesn't exist unless you spin up Hackintoshes, which then usually don't have the proper Bluetooth drivers. So the entire testing of this requires us to actually get together physically and test it, which has been kind of hard considering they live in Canada. Or you just do a simulation, do a simulation on physical devices, take that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're gonna work on stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, if you have any MacBooks you're willing to donate, we'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> So here what happened is we're both running a relayer with just a basic uh, service that implements uh, just normal messaging between <coughs> Eric and I. It's a chat app. It's a, essentially it's a terminal chat app that just spams a main channel. Um, it's sent to a service directly so that anyone who would be connected to this channel would now just be receiving these messages in our proximity, which is pretty cool. Um, Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the code to some of this stuff. This font is also too small. No, that's not how we do that. So pinch. Or unpinch. Or wait. Go. Wait, what? Oh, what? Oh, yeah. Do you guys know how to use your fucking knife? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. The problem with presentation mode is, though, you don't have a. You don't have a. Any questions while Dean, you know, uh, So you do message replaying? Like if the network gets partitioned and then reconstructed, you replay messages? That yeah, are messages are retransmissioned by nodes. Yes, yeah, so you can queue like for a couple of times and then... Exactly, like, yeah. So right now what happens is a message will hop around in a network for quite some time 
until nodes no longer choose to retransmit it. It's a, as I said, it's a very naive uh, sending algorithm, which I will show you here. Here we go. That's some ugly code right there. So this is essentially the send function. Um, and what happens in the first check is we ensure that the message either has a recipient, which is a device, um, or a service, which is like a characteristic like uh, Ethereum transactions or whatever. Um, the recipient is a identifier, is identified by a public key so that uh, one recipient can have multiple transports attached to it, kind of how uh, multi-addresses work in the P2P. And then what we do is we try to serialize a message because it's a protocol buffer that's not really that important. And then we get to, um, we iterate over our transports and our transports have specific peers. And what we first do is we check if that um, if our recipient isn't empty, we try to find a peer to send to that that has that specific peer ID. And if we do that, we return, we've done a successful send. We don't need to send it to anyone anymore. What we do otherwise is we look for all the peers which uh, implement that specific service, and we then flood that message to every single member who implements that service. And when we do uh, a flood send, we ensure that we're not sending a message to the person we received it from, or the person who originally sent it. So if, um, for example, Eric sends Greg a message, and then Greg passes that on to me, I won't send it to any one of those anymore. But for example, if Eric sends Greg a message, and then there's someone between, um, Greg and I, Greg may receive that message again because we don't have the entire uh, send history. We only have the, the first because that's the original sender and the latest because that's the person we got it from. There are optimizations we can do to this. And then we count how many peers we sent it to because if, if we sent it to none now, this is part of our naive approach, we end up just flooding it to everyone of our peers which is kind of ugly, but it works for our current implementation use case. So that's pretty much architecturally, yeah? I was going to ask about the two different um, Bluetooth versus Wi-Fi Direct with the, the geographical range. You talk about do you have different peer lists and peer discovery mechanisms? Um, yeah, there will be different like ways of, because for Bluetooth as well, Bluetooth it limits itself onto eight peers. So we need to optimize that we're, uh, peering with the best possible peers at a specific time. With Wi-Fi Direct, you don't really have that. You can start direct connections with, I think, almost like 16 or 17 devices at the same time. With Bluetooth, you're limited to eight, so the way we peer right now is very naive, but there is um, open research issues on how to best peer with other members. So because of the limitations of all these things, like we have naive implementations, but we know, of course, that we need to have better implementations. And discovery and routing will be different based on device, of course, like find pathfinding, etc. But yeah, that's pretty much the entire send function, and this is pretty much the hardest part of ultralight beam. Like when you implement a transport, you don't need to care about this. Uh, when you implement a service, you don't need to care about this. We take care of that. Then I'll quickly show how um, transports work. Showed in a very rough way because there's a lot of ugly code on top of it. What happens is a transport asset implements this send and this listen function, and they then have callback functions, which is like the transport received certain data, which is uh, which the node implements so that when uh, data is received, the node tries to unpack it, checks if it is supposed to uh, handle that data, and then passes it one layer up, which would be, for example, your application. So the node does all that checking for you. So if you implement Ultralight Beam, you can be certain that you're only receiving packets that you know how to handle or that were sent to you directly and um, are not just packets that you're meant to forward. Because right now what we have Ultralight beam nodes are um, all have a forward capability so that we can have this strong network. So even like 
if you were building a chat app and someone else is building a game, for example, and those both implement Ultralight Beam, what will happen is your chat app might actually relay someone else's game app packets. And that way you can build like a really strong network. Like, just imagine in New York City if WhatsApp and both Telegram had offline messaging, you'd never waste data again because you just walk through other people's phones. So yeah, that's pretty much what we have. Um, I'm gonna show the relayer code as well. A lot of this code which we have external in the relayer is gonna become uh, node native code later on. That's an open pull request right now. But relayers are really simple as well. What happens is it checks if we have that specific service and then that message is processed by a specific service. So in the case of our chat app, it was really just decoding the data that we had in our packet and printing it out. But yeah. I don't know if I have that branch. Thing. I don't have internet. Oh, yeah. See, if we had an ultralight beam, we could use GitHub. <laughs> uh, are you guys concerned that the, the relayers will just be passing so much through that they find it frustrating and they want to like opt out and so there's this kind of... There's, there's, so what we're thinking of right now is like an accounting model uh, that we do some form of tit for tat that you wouldn't continue <coughs> relaying messages through for someone given that they have used up all their bandwidth unless they, for example, start paying. But the second we have some naive accounting model, we can figure out the incentive models on top of that. So that's why we started it at S New York because we thought about this would be cool if we then also have payment channels on top of it. So that's someone like you pay for relays, right? Which we can do, and it might be it would probably end up being cheaper for than having to get data to certain places. And they have like distinct identities in the peer list to say like they yeah you get there and then you go out exactly yeah. yeah. I mean, everything can be smoothed, but, yeah. Are there any questions? Have we thoughts on spam? Spam attacks on the network? Or? Not yet, like we're very early stage and spam attacks and man that's are relatively hard to solve. Uh, have you looked into ways that are run like this? Mm -hmm. Or just like, don't think you're going to It's probably still some subscribers or What's it called? So we were looking into more traditional MANnet uh, routing protocols, and there's three of those essentially that are used for MANnets. Because the problem, the problem with a lot of uh, these routing protocols is that they don't work the second you add in the aspect of uh, connections being very short-lived. So I don't know if Quasar can likely also be a problem, but it also Okay. Thank you. Yeah, mainnet routing is hard. It's there's like three. Yeah, as Dean said, there's like three different kinds. Um, there's obviously trade-offs in like processing speed or like yeah, like you can either have like very accurate routing or you can have uh, or or you would have to do like a lot a lot of computations. So uh, yeah, one of our next steps is going to be investigate like building out all of these different ones and do benchmarks and testing them out. Um, and obviously doing original research on routing and see if we can come up with something better as well. <clears throat> also with, when it comes to the relayers, um, to kind of address like your question about like the throughput, um, that ideally in, let's say, let's call it like in New York, let's use New York as an example, in a festival it's a little bit easier, you can probably get away with like, um, with just like a mobile phone. Um, or a tablet, you know, kind of doing that. Um, in, in a dense city or in a much more dense area, let's say, uh, let, let's use the protest going on, right? Like a protest that goes on um, where you have like a lot of people running around. Ideally, um, what you could do in those situations is uh, kind of set up like the actual devices that are meant to be relayers. Um, you know, it could be as simple as like, you know, battery packs in a backpack and like a pretty powerful computer running in there. Um, relayers that are intended for dense areas should not be a phone. They should be something that you know can actively take a beating and are expected to take a beating, so that you can actually get the throughput we need. Um, and again, it's like specific. It's for the specifics. 
would you be able as a normal non-relayer ahead of time to say, I want to contribute to this? Like, if you, if you do have the capacity potentially to do it, but you don't want to spend the data, and you sort of yeah. take the hit for everybody. And yeah, yeah, so, do this and kind yeah of exactly. So the beauty, the beauty of all this is that um, you can choose which service it transports you want to use. So you can choose Bluetooth Wi-Fi. You can also choose what type of a node you're running. Um, obviously, incentivization laws would be cool, but like you know, I, we don't really want to deal with crypto economics. This is like more of like a you know, it's a goodwill, or it's like a it's like a public good. Like you know, when you need this, it should be used. I don't. We don't. It'd be beautiful if this was like running all the time in like a subway, you know. Um, but in ideal, ideally, and realistically speaking, this is something that should be used in like very. For the use cases at hand, like concerts and whatnot, um, to which like people are going in, understanding the conditions and like knowing that like this is just like a very viable way to like reliably communicate with peers. Yeah. This isn't like you know, AT and T giving you <laughs> cell coverage. <laughs> I guess at a concert, you're also talking to other people at the concert. Yeah. Right? Right. So ideally, yeah. ideally, you'd never actually hit a relayer. Yeah. Like, given there would be enough device coverage in a place like New York City, you'd never actually hit a relayer because you would just halt until yeah. the destination was found. That's also something that I like, guess I glossed over. Like, you don't actually need, ever need the internet in these use cases. Uh, we always say the internet so that it's like, oh wait, like your phone that's not connected can talk to people, but in reality, as Dean says, if like at a concert you're just trying to coordinate like where you're sit where you're standing, right? And like that's what's really powerful is that you can say like where you are. Um, kind of like the same thing with like uh, you know, a live protest or whatever, you can like it's a lot easier to coordinate where you are when there's like a million people. Uh, you know, when the Raptors won the uh, NBA title, uh, I was trapped in the streets of Toronto and literally did not know where my friends were. Um, it was awful. And like that's kind of like where the use case like is, becomes very powerful and that's why I say it's very like use case specific. I don't think that's something that should be like widely deployed 24-7, rather like deployed a very on a location basis. Yeah, um, do you guys have any sort of like uh, account mechanism besides like I guess what would be like Bluetooth load or your Mac of a device, right? So like basically to make it sound like not a troll box, right? Because like if I'm at a concert and there's like a million messages going through, filter for mine and my friends, right? Yeah, identity, like you're talking about identity basically, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, here, nodes have identities. But just through the Bluetooth Mac? No, the, because uh, so Bluetooth Max often aren't exposed by high-level APIs because of security reasons. So, so what ends up being exposed is a UUID that is changed for every device. So there's a, devices have a public key, a private key, kind of like in libp to p So you have an identity that can be found on X transports. Um, okay. The I mean the UUID can be set. So I guess you have your public private key accounts. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Is there any information, like, if you're the attendant recipient, your example about the Raptors downtown and trying to find somebody else, is there any information about when you receive a message, which direction that came from, so you could potentially use this for, like, a hot or colder, naive implementation, where your friends aren't saying, here's where we are, but you're trying to get to where that message initiated physically because of all these, like... Yeah, so in theory, yeah, in theory you can do that because um, a, a group of people, I think there's two separate groups of people, one at University of Waterloo, one at University of Toronto, um, where they were actually, they're able to, it's theoretically possible, um, we don't have it right now, um, where they were able to actually um, do indoor offline GPS uh, by bouncing off of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth signals um, to understand where they are in proximity to the building. Um, so it's definitely possible, um, and I do know that you do have access to a range in Bluetooth. Yeah. Um, I don't know about Wi-Fi. Yeah, you, yeah, you have you have some sort of access to something, so you can. Um, it would but require SSI's range, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. SSI signal strength. strength. Right. Yeah, but you'd have to do some like pretty nifty <laughs> accounting to kind of like basically, you'd have to like essentially like retriangulate the entire shape, right? Because you'd get some like really ugly shape. Yeah. You get some zigzag, right? And you'd have to basically find like this right. straight line somewhere. How how long would those jars be <coughs> based on? So Bluetooth, you're looking at what 35 feet tops. Yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. looking at like 35 feet tops, and you, like realistically speaking, you could probably expect to get like upwards of like eight hops 
like if you're in like close together, like within a, I'd say 100 meters, you can probably at least get eight hops, maybe more. Yeah. So you're like, there's a, it's a lot of data to be also transmitting across the wire because we don't we don't keep that. <coughs> As Dean was saying, we only keep the last recipient and the first one. Um, we could maybe maybe add a counter to some degree, but you know it's also it's, it becomes a very difficult yeah, like. Well. Yeah. Well, you can put a little gossip protocol on top of this, right? Where you can do whatever you want. Yeah, you can have like a message latency between the different peers, and you can get like kind of an idea of where somebody is. Yeah. So on, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you can like attach like a bunch of metadata to like your your packet based on like pre like the previous sender, and then based on that, you can decide like how to which peer to send it to next best, right? Like using like the R RSSI example. Um, I guess generally, signal strength doesn't necessarily mean like somebody's further or not, but I mean sometimes it does. But like you can, if you were trying to disseminate information really quickly, right? You can attach like RSSI um, information to like your UV packet, and then you try you prioritize sending it to like the person who's furthest away, and then going down on that, and in that way you can like disseminate information like super quickly, right? Because you know that guy's far away, so then he tries to send it to his peers. Pops randomly, you know, and then like. How do you guys think about using radio? <coughs> it was like one slide to talk about radio. Oh, we're gonna do it as a troll transport. <laughs> Someone's working on it right now, actually. <laughs> troll? Yeah, because it's like you know those hobbyist radio dudes who like send see, messages across yeah. Europe. And yeah, yeah, someone is working on a transport for that. But like, I mean, in theory, you can radio goes a lot further, right? Yeah, yeah. If you've already established that it's like if you use the acknowledge thing you were talking about earlier, and they found each other. Potentially have something where then the radio signals trigger and sort of on some sort of frequency that's also whatever it's really light you know, payload, and then boom, you've got an actual direct path to. You know what you signal. should do? You should go on our GitHub. There's a <laughs> there's a research there's a research repository, and if you have any ideas like that, just write up an issue with like any research interesting research ideas. But like we're trying to get as many people as well as possible to contribute on this. What's that company that does, I think they've done Bitcoin transactions over radio, they have like these little... Yeah, but the difference about their thing is you need external devices for their mesh net, net, net. What's, do you know the name of the company? I can't uh, I, I keep hearing the bloody name. Uh, no, no, I'm Somebody keeps sending it to us. Someone keeps sending it to us, yeah, and we've kept being like, we don't want to do this because you need separate devices, okay, so and it only sends Bitcoin transactions. Okay, so it's... it's specific to their device, you can't yeah. generalize? No, it's, it's, it's a generalized thing that then someone built Bitcoin stuff on, but it requires specific hardware. Okay. It requires your phone to be plugged into an antenna. Go antenna. Oh, go Yeah. Go antenna, exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's patented, yeah. it's closed source. Oh, that's... Yeah, we like, don't trust the stuff. Like, the main reason we're doing this, yeah, there's like, obviously, <laughs> I think in, during the umbrella, well, no, now in Hong Kong, there's like, because fire chat used to exist. Yeah, that's yeah. And what happened there is the developer was told by the Chinese government to stop building on it because he's a Chinese citizen. Right. And now there's like another one, and they have an SDK, but it's a closed source SDK, and you need an API key, which seems kind of weird yeah. that you can have an API key in an offline messaging. Yeah, so. basically, there's like two companies that are working on mandates right now. There's fire chat, and there's like the other thing. Bridgify. But they're both proprietary, they're closed source. Yeah, Bridgify. Oh yeah, Bridgify, yeah. They're closed source, they cost money to use. It's like, we don't want to pay for this. We just want, want to be able to like just download it and use it. Like we just did. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I think it's what? Free open source software, technically? <laughs> I think it's MIT. Yeah, yeah, it's all MIT licensed. Yeah. And that's the point, right? Oh, like, steal, steal it, yeah, run it, use it. Like, this is a free public good for people, right? This is, and as you said, hey, radios, that just means we can, as soon as we get better bands and higher, like, what low frequency goes further, yeah, once we get more, like, low frequency bands, just, like, think of the possibilities here. We can literally be running, like, another sub internet protocol, like, because why would I want to use the internet when it's attached to an ISP, right? Um, there's a lot of possibilities here. Um, design space is huge, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't you need to cache the unique ID of the messages that you're providing around? Because you could run into an infinite loop with four offline nodes. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys are caching. Like you, you, we are caching right now in the naive implementation, but there's a discussion going on on how we best do that. Oh right, gotcha. Yeah. There, there, there's also a question of if we need to build a data sync protocol on top of it, something like TCP, 
so that we can assert that messages are somehow received. But the question then there is how do we do that with all the hops that are in between two points? Yeah. So there's a lot of there, there's a lot of ideas that we are floating around, but a lot of uh, research that needs to be done to figure out optimal solutions. And like there's clever tricks you could do that um, we've thought about. So if, for instance, you had the ability, you also had a low frequency band, we could, in, you could in theory set something up where the acknowledgements go over the low frequency band so that everybody can receive it. Um, and we don't actually use it to actually disrupt the network and you go and use Wi-Fi and Bluetooth where we can send way more, you know, more bigger payloads. Um, uh, across and that that could be a way to like cheaply do it um, mm -hmm. you know when the device receives a message it goes hey I received it like fine like if this is you thank you right um, but again these are all like open questions and obviously becomes hardware challenges and we're trying to make it so that ideally it doesn't matter like you shouldn't have to have hardware and we also have the challenge of like battery on a mobile phone right Your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi direct to you don't want that to be on all the time because at one point you're going to run out of battery. Yeah. So there's a bunch of those technical challenges. You should allow people to harvest the battery life in three layers. <laughs> <laughs> Send a message and just get battery life. UV <laughs> battery. That's actually a thing in nice Yeah. Because you, like, you could attach weights to anything. All right.